work uh, um, with my uh, student uh, 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 and it's going to be somewhat uh, conjectural picture um, of uh, <coughs> attempting to try and resolve some of the issues with uh, really, I mean, as I say, Galen in the title, but secretly what I'm interested in is massive gravity theories, high gravity, and so on. Uh, which we know there are various issues with the possibility of UV completing these. And uh, what I'm going to conjecture is one potential uh, story for, for uh, doing it. So just to remind you, um, it's known, uh, so we've heard about all these different types of theories, like we've got massive gravity, um, and then bigravity, and multigravity. Uh, and all of these, you can think of these going this way, you can think of these as extensions <laughs> of those. But in, in practice, you can also go the other way, starting with a multigravity theory. You can always take decoupling limits uh, by taking the various Planck masses to infinity, the decoupled sectors of, uh, of the gravitons uh, going to biogravity, and then ultimately massive gravity. So there is a well defined set of decoupling limits where various Planck masses uh, for the extra metrics. Uh, go to infinity, which will re reproduce these things. So these, are, these theories are all connected with each other, uh, which means that they all have similar properties at the quantum level. Uh, and it's also known that all of these theories, you can take decoupling limits, which um, isolate the physics, essentially, of the less zero mode of the gravitons, the massive gravitons, there may be more than one if you're in multigravity. Uh, and in those decoupling limits, what you get is our Galilean-type theories with some uh, slight uh, uh, modification that you have couplings in, mass, in, in these kind of theories, you get couplings of the Galilean to map that you wouldn't typically imagine in Galilean theories, but I think we, we could just generalize our notion of what we mean by Galilean and stick that under the umbrella. Uh, so, uh, so the problem uh, sits here, or the problem is within here. So this Galilean is describing the Hilesky zero mode of the gravitons, and so if you were in multigravity, you would get multi-Galilean type theories. And the problem is that we know that all of these theories, uh, unlike the isolated possible case of the partially massless, um, which is, its existence is, uh, as a gravity theory is, is not known, or whether it may exist in a gauge theory type forms, as Kurt was saying, all of these theories have uh, a common set of issues, which is that they have a low strong coupling scale. Uh, so in massive gravity, in four dimensions, there is a scale lambda defined by the relation m Planck times the graviton mass squared. In bigravity, uh, there's some associated uh, geometric combination of the, of the Planck scales. In multigravity, there's some analogous scale. Uh, but in all of these theories, there's some scale lambda which uh, sits between the graviton mass but is typically well below the Planck scale if you want the graviton mass to be well below the Planck scale, which you usually do for phenomenological purposes. Uh, and at that scale, perturbation theory breaks down. But it's perturbations for Listy 0 mode, not the Listy 2. So Listy 2 remains weak <coughs> coupled to that scale, and the Listy 0 mode becomes uh, strongly coupled. Uh, and so some people would call that the uh, cutoff of the effective field theorem. Uh, because uh, if, you, if you say that what that means is that this, the massive gravity, all these theories are non-renormalizable theories uh, in which the scale of the non-renormalizable interactions is not suppressed by the Planck scale, but is suppressed by this very low scale. Okay? So if you view these as non-renormalizable field theories in the same sense that the Fermi theory is a non-renormalizable field theory, uh, that gets um, uh, UV completed into uh, to the electric weak model. Uh, so you might imagine that there's some new degrees of freedom that come in at that scale, uh, but UV complete these uh, particular models. Now, if that were the right answer, that would already mean that when we write down something like massive gravity or bigravity, then uh, we shouldn't really make too much of a deal out of, well, I guess we should, but we shouldn't make too much of a deal out of these ghost-free type structures. Uh, 
any, any other, uh, because we should really add to this uh, an infinite number of other operators uh, suppressed by higher powers of derivatives, and something like drag k uh, squared, etc. Uh, appropriately suppressed by, in a way I'm not going to get right now, because I'm just doing it on the blackboard, but appropriately suppressed once you canonically normalize the degrees of freedom by powers of that scale around it. That's what you would expect from an effective field theory uh, point of view. Uh, now, if that were the right answer, that means that we'd have to be very careful when we look at the phenomenology of these theories, because if you just say looking at cosmological solutions of this theory, uh, you'd have to make sure that all these terms were small uh, in, the, in those cosmological solutions. And because that scale is so low, typically that gets violated uh, quite easily. So, uh, so that's one issue. One well-known issue. This, yeah. yeah. Um, usually, can you remind us what is the, the scale of the small m? You usually have the Hubble scale today as in mind because you want to tie it to a couple of It doesn't have to be, though. I mean, that's, that's very model dependent. But whatever it is, it's well below the Planck scale. Mm. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking. <laughs> we wouldn't be talking about it. <coughs> um, so that's, that's problem number one. The second problem is that, yeah, uh, so, can I ask? Yeah. So, so is it really violated usually because uh, if the Hubble is much smaller than lambda, then those terms are still smaller? Uh, no, it depends what question you're asking. I mean, they always come in at some point, right? So uh, you, sure. have to, you have to establish yeah, a yeah. particular physical system. Yeah, at least, at least if, you're, yeah. if you're looking at it, at least as an effective theory at Hubble scales, that should be fine. That's right, that's right. The Hubble scales, isn't, they're not an issue. That's for sure. So it depends what, what <coughs> question you ask. But ultimately, they come in, the point is they come in at much lower than you, than quantum gravity effects come yeah. in. So we still have to worry about them. And they come in at a scale which is lower than, uh, you know, TV scale physics comes. Uh, so the second issue is that uh, all of these theories, um, if you uh, admit solutions in which the low energy effective field theory would appear to have superluminal uh, propagation, that's, that's true of all of these guys. This was known even before massive gravity was written down because it was known from, uh, because the massive gravity was constructed uh, to be a completion of uh, the Galilean type model. And it was already known in the days of DGP model that uh, its decoupling limit, which was the Galilean, admitted superluminal uh, solutions. Uh, and so these are superluminalities in the low energy effective field. Uh, and that's obviously uh, an issue uh, that has been uh, an issue from the very beginning. And that's equally true in massive gravity, bigravity, and multigravity. All, all, of these, all of these theories have that issue. And closely related to that are, yeah. Here. So, uh, is it uh, Galileo which is superluminal? Well, um, the Galileo is usually the first one to become superluminal, but actually everybody can become superluminal. Okay. So, now, so this is consistent with defining the light point in terms of, because the Galileo is a matrix point, isn't it? Yeah. So it's in principle, having a non-zero Galileo means that your light point itself gets modified. That's right. So this, this superluminality takes that into account? Uh, yeah, it takes it in account. The problem is that what happens is that you take like by gravity, you think you've got two metrics, but you've actually got at least three metrics. Because there's a G metric, there's an F metric, and there's a metric in which the list is zero mode propagates. And they're all different. And each one of them can be faster than the other one uh, in different regimes. So I can make, I can find solutions where G, yeah. the light cone of G lies outside of the light cone of F, lies outside the light cone of the list of zero mode. But I can also find other solutions where it's the other way around. And that's why you sort of guarantee it. But the LSD zero mode is part of a matrix. Yes. So that's right. Okay. Yeah. 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 But this, the, it's it's almost it's almost trivial that it rises just because you have so many metrics yeah. and so many effective metrics running around. And so then the question is, who's what's the right thing to impose causality? Yeah. The problem is, the the best solution would have been that one of those metrics was always outside of all the others, right? So that there's maybe maybe the G effective metric. So this is zero mode lies outside that for G, lies outside for that, that F. The problem is you can always find solutions which is the other way around. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that, that argument doesn't work. And that's why it appears that these all have super 
Now, tied to this are arguments based on uh, uh, S-matrix analyticity. Uh, and these, again, this goes back to DGP days because these are all at oil issues in DGP and they haven't really, nothing really changed in going to say massive gravity type theories. Uh, and this is the statement that um, the, if you look at the uh, scattering, the 2 2 scattering amplitude, uh, let's call it A as a function of the minus down variables, S, T, and U, so S square root of S is basically the center of mass energy. Uh, and T is the momentum transfer, actually minus T, square root of minus T is the momentum. Uh, and then these, of course, satisfy the normal uh, Mandelstam relations. If you look at this scattering amplitude, uh, and let's look at it uh, in the forward scattering loop. <coughs> so that's where the angle of scattering is essentially zero, which corresponds to that T is zero. Then it is well known that um, in a local field theory, you can prove rigorously Uh, based just on uh, assuming the Wyman axioms and uh, causality for local field theory, that the scattering amplitude in that limit, let me just call it A of S, uh, emits, uh, is analytic, it's an analytic function in the complex S plane, with branch cuts starting at 4m squared uh, and going back from zero. Uh, with uh, what are called uh, with two subtractions. So what that means is that I can write it. Uh, if I had no subtractions, then if this were if I, a of s were an analytic function, then it would mean that I could infer the value at any point in the complex plane uh, by using Cauchy theorem and doing an integral around the following contour that goes around the branch cuts like that uh, to infer the value at some point here. Just use Cauchy theorem. And what that corresponds to concretely is that up to some uh, pole terms, which are not too important for this discussion, um, <laughs> this is the integral along this uh, branch cut, which goes from 4m squared outwards. You have, uh, you can just set, set up a standard dispersion relation, which looks like this something like that, and then there's another piece which is a crossing symmetric thing which comes from the branch cut uh, going this way, which you can also write uh, in the manifest link. Sorry, that's mu. Uh, T, mu, uh, minus 4 m squared, plus x. It's actually so mu, mu, mu minus mu. And so that would be a dispersion relation without subtractions. This is, this is just a standard dispersion relation you use, you derive based on uh, uh, complex analysis. Uh, but that's not the correct answer because uh, the amplitude grows as some power as you go out to infinity. Uh, but then Poisson famously proved, or really Poisson and Martin uh, famously proved that uh, in a local field theory, uh, the amplitude, A of S, could not go faster than S times log S, uh, which is less than S squared. Uh, so that would mean that uh, you, would not, you would only need to perform what, two subtractions in this dispersion relation, and what you do is you rewrite the dispersion relation as some constant, uh, plus B times S, plus then something like this, imaginary, and then we have uh, S squared, imaginary A of mu over mu squared, mu minus S, uh, plus the crossing symmetry combination of one by writing down. And so the amplitude has to take this form for any local field theory. That's, I mean, that's a rigorously proved statement from uh, the Wyman axioms and stuff like that. And here's where the problem comes, that if you, uh, this, uh, this, here this is derived for a theory with a mass gap, with a mass m, 
Um, and that, of course, is how the Galilean actually arises in all these theories. It, it's a list zero mode of the graviton, so it really does have a mass. Uh, so it's legit, legitimate. <coughs> <laughs> and the problem is that uh, unitarity uh, through the optical theorem implies that the imaginary part of uh, excuse me, Andrew. Uh, yeah. Does this theorem works also for gauge theories, or I mean, you need to assume some kind of uh, positivity? This thing, yeah. It works for gauge theories. So, in, so in, in principle, for gauge theory, there are, there are kind of subtleties. So. There are subtleties, that's right. But okay. there, there is an analogous statement. Uh, so, yeah. <coughs> but the Galilean, this level yeah, is a scalar field theory, so we don't have to worry about that. No. There's no local system. <laughs> um, is that the imaginary part of the cross section uh, goes like, uh, yeah, yeah, I got it wrong around. Uh, the optical theorem tells us this is true. So if the imaginary part of the cross section by the quasar, uh, so, so the first thing is that tells you this is the total cross section, and this obviously has to be positive, again by unitarity. So unitarity fixes the imaginary part to be uh, positive. This thing is positive, and then from this relation, you can easily see if you uh, differentiate it twice. Uh, then uh, in the, the near s and take the limit s goes to zero. <coughs> the first two terms, the subtraction terms, drop out, and the main term comes from differentiating uh, this piece. And so, and then inside this integral, I can just set s to zero, and so I get something like uh, there's a two, and then there's a, there's a two from the s squared, and then there's a four because of the crossing symmetry. Well, no, separated, so there's two integral 4m squared to infinity, uh, what I can now write as s sigma, sorry, mu sigma mu um, over uh, mu q mu, the crossing symmetry term. Uh, and the point is that the right hand side here is manifestly positive. Uh, so this thing has to be positive because these are equated. Um, and now let's take the limit of both sides where, so that was in the limit of s is zero. Now let's take on the both sides the limit where m goes to zero. So we had a mass of Galileo m, but I can also, in the decoupling limit, we actually take the mass to zero, and I'm not just allowed to take the mass to zero. The right hand side is the limit mass goes to zero, something with a cross section in. Now in the mass plus goes to zero, you still have a Galileo and you still have interaction, so the cross section remains non zero. Uh, so this is still a non-zero positive quantity in the massless limit. But on this side, in the massless limit, we have a, a pure Galilean with the Galilean shift symmetry completely intact. Uh, uh, so remember, we're still, we're still just, in, we have in mind, we're scattering LST zero modes in a bigravity, multigravity, massive gravity. Uh, but in the limit we're looking at, the leading uh -huh. contribution of low energies in the massless limit will basically be determined by the Galilean contribution. And it's known for the Galilean that the uh, lowest order contribution to the scattering amplitude uh, in the s goes to zero limit uh, is just by dimensions, uh, looks like that. And so as you take t to zero, you become minus s. This thing goes to zero, and so the Galilean, you have exactly in the massless limit. Uh, this is equal to zero. Uh, so the left hand side is zero, the right hand side is non zero. Uh, is, this, is it yeah. obvious that the cross section doesn't go to, to zero? Well, uh, because the tree amplitude does. The cross section, so just the tree part? I mean, uh, the. <coughs> Why does it? This is just s cubed plus t cubed plus u cubed. No, no, but this cross section is the integral. It's not the low energy limit. It's the cross section integrated over all the. Yeah, is it, is it obvious that that doesn't go to zero? Oh, so? yeah. Just because it's an interacting theory. If this was zero, then uh, it would be a free theory. But, uh, this is just the four. It could be the other, like the five particle amplitude or something, could be non zero. Just okay, that's right. true, that's true, but at loop order you expect every, somebody to come in and contribute to the 2-2. Uh, 
and the and the loops come in at the scale lambda. So yeah, I mean, unless there's some magic that that, that could that could be a loophole, but I don't think that's possible. Yeah, that would be a crazy. That would be a crazy loophole, right? So that that is the argument that um, this is the argument used by Adam et al. in 2006. Uh, to uh, they used it, they wanted to use it to rule out the DGP model as having a UV completion. Uh, but the same argument applies to uh, all of these theories. And this argument is closely connected, although not identically the same as the as the existence of the super now. Actually, could it be a problem of the limit? It could be a problem of the limit, right? So somehow, uh, uh, so it's well known that the massless, for a purely massless theory, if I, if I didn't add a mass into this argument, if I took the massless theory, then the Poisson bound doesn't apply. In fact, the first, there is a Poisson bound. But the, in the massless limit, the cross-section can grow as power. Uh, and in that case, you, uh, you may have to, if that power is larger than two, you may have to perform more subtractions. And if you have to perform more subtractions, uh, then, uh, then you don't get a condition on a double prime, you get an A condition on uh, to the next guy's A4 primes, uh, because A3 primes are zero just by crossing symmetry. Uh, and that guy uh, has to be positive by unitarity. But actually, for a Galilean, I can write down a Galilean invariant operator that would give that being positive. So one possible resolution is that the massless Galilean should not, for some reason I can't uh, say, should not be thought of as the mass goes to zero limit of a mass of Galilean. Uh, it's somehow an isolated theory, and then for that isolated theory there would be no problem. Another possibility is actually in the case of uh, the DGP model, this argument was faulty because in the DGP, DGP model, uh, the uh, Listy zero mode is actually a resonant mode. Uh, it doesn't have a definite mass. It actually has a distribution of masses uh, with some spectral density. And that distribution already starts at MS0. Uh, and the fact that it starts at MS0 means there's a branch cut in the amplitude that comes all the way to MS0. So this, this formula was then incorrect. But Poisson needed to... Uh, uh, to prove the Poisson bound, you have to assume that you actually have a mass gap. Uh, and so if the branch code actually comes all the way to zero, as it does in the DGP model, the argument is also uh, faulty. But, but, but in, in the hard, ma in, in the in hard mass, mass gravity, then it doesn't then work. We know that you know, cannot take the higher than... That's the right. I mean, yeah. the of the yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. And by gravity, you have always have a mass that's that's right. In, in the bigravity, you do have a massless guy, uh, which does alter the argument because you have a pole then at this point, which you have to subtract down. But the problem is that um, uh, then you can just refine this argument and separate out the pole and, and do the argument again, and then you'll find the same problem. And the, and the problem is in bigravity, the pole contribution comes in at a different scale because you know you can decouple it. And there's no way that different scale can resolve that particular issue. But it would seem, as far as I can see at the moment, if you had a theory like DGP, like cascading gravity, like these extramental setups, where there was a continuum, the mass was really a resonance, it wasn't a hard mass, then the branch cut would come to the origin, and then that seems to be a loophole in that reason, which is interesting. OK. But we're, uh, I mean, I'm interested for, for now in, in these guys, just to see how to make sense of those. Um, so, uh, one possibility, well, so, the assumptions that go into to this statement are very weak. They are, uh, um, you know, unitarity, uh, which we never want to give up. There are uh, Lorentz invariants, <coughs> which we can give up, uh, you know, because we know we can write down Lorentz violating massive theory of gravities, and so uh, we could go that way. Uh, and then, of course, in Lorentz violating theory, the issue with supernalities is less obviously an issue because you've already broken Lorentz invariants and so on and so on. 
Um, so you could go that way, but then, uh, but of course, if we were given the rents and rents completely, uh, then why would we have constructed these particular theories in the first place? Because rents violate the massive gravity was around well before, and then you can have two degrees of freedom. You have no listing zero mode. You have no need for a Bleistein, and it's much more straightforward. So what I'd like to do is keep this, and then the last assumption is uh, is uh, micro locality or micro causality to be the same in the Lorentz and Grain theory, which of course is the statement that the field operators uh, commute outside the light zone. Uh, and why that feeds into this is that uh, locality implies that the uh, Wyman functions, which are the uh, non terminated uh, expectation values, two point functions, is the Wyman function. Uh, that these things are uh, tempered distributions. That basically means that um, the Fourier transform, if I stick these in Fourier space, dpi k dot x minus y times some function of k, <coughs> to be a tempered distribution, this thing grows no faster than a polynomial, so that then, uh, basically, so this integral always converges, the oscillations are going to uh, uh, kill off the high k behavior and mean, mean that it can define us as a well-defined thing in position space. So one of the Weinman axioms that goes into this proof is this uh, tempered distribution statement. Uh, and the fact that, these, that this thing being the spectral density, before you transform with the Weinman function, this thing growing no faster than a polynomial uh, basically implies that the Scattering amplitude, so if, if rho of k is bounded by a polynomial, bounded some, by some power of k, then that implies that the scattering amplitudes are bounded uh, by some power of s in the complex plane. And that was the sufficient condition used by Poisson to derive the Poisson bound. Uh, so uh, if I gave up this, then I would give up uh, that, and then I would give up the Poisson bound and then I would give up that reasoning, and you could have potentially more uh, subtractions. Now, why would I give that up? Um, this is, uh, so this is somewhat of a radical thing, so what I'm, what I'm basically saying is that the Galilean field theory, if, if I'm gonna quantize it in a unitary and Lorentz invariant way, can't possibly satisfy all of the Wyman axioms, which means it's not a local field theory, and I'm gonna give up the temperedness uh, assumption, which is going to imply some degree of non-locality in this theory, uh, although a mild degree of non-locality. I'm going to try and convince you why that's not an unreasonable thing to do. Uh, how long have I got, Chief? Fifteen, Fifteen minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, so why, why, why is that uh, not completely crazy? <coughs> so, first off, um, these uh, what. In the, in the end, these Galileans are rising as decoupling limits of gravitational theories. Okay, so these are, these are really gravity theories. <coughs> and the Galilean here is the Lisby zero mode of gravity. And why is that important? Because already general relativity violates already uh, general relativity, uh, whatever, any, any quantum gravity completion of general relativity violates polynomial boundaries. Uh, but violates the assumption that the scattering amplitude uh, grows as a polynomial everywhere in the complex uh, plane. In other words, already general relativity, despite the action being local, the classical action is local, nevertheless the quantum theory has to violate uh, uh, some degree of locality. Uh, How do you see that? How do you see that? So you look at the scattering amplitude and you see that it violates polynomial boundaries. Um, and so, for, but for a discussion... Am I wrong, am I, am I wrong that technically the, um, the axioms are violated by any gauge theory in four dimensions, right? Technically, I mean... Because again, is it positivity? We know what well, gauge theories need to have a the inverse space is not really as not a positive metric, right? So 
but technically, right. from a mathematical point of view, gate theories doesn't, doesn't, do, do not exist, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a whole, so, you know, there's a million dollars on that one, right? Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Yeah, I'm not a million dollars. Dollar. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, non trivial scale theories don't exist either. Yeah, that's right. But for different reasons. For in principle, they could exist, but no one is, was able to, you know, to bring one from, from the non trivial, uh, there is not free, in a sense. But, yeah, right. gauge theory is even more tricky. That's right. But in a sense, those issues are a whole other set of issues that. Yeah. that so is it, but is there an easy way to see that you get this different growth? Of the yeah, so, so yeah, let me just say, so uh, of course, um, without fully understanding everything about quantum gravity, that is to some extent uh, conjectural, but I refer you to the review, to your review article by Giddings and Porto uh, on the gravitational S matrix, or something like that. Uh, in which they go through all the uh, arguments for that. And so one of those arguments is that already in the iconal scattering limit, which is the limit, one limit we expect, we think we understand, uh, where the classical GR part of the action actually determines the, uh, uh, the scattering matrix, at least at the leading order, very well. Uh, so the iconal limit is the, is the, base of the limit that, that Tuff did. Uh, it corresponds if you think of scattering two very high energy beings off each other, you can think of this guy, instead of scattering off the particle, it scatters off essentially the, uh, um, the shot, well, the calculation that Tuff did is it calculated, is it can think of this particle as creating a, a, a semi-classical shock wave geometry, and this particle scatters off that shock wave geometry. And in Feynman diagram terms, that corresponds to resumming an infinite number of ladder diagrams. Uh, that's the iconal scattering limit, which is well understood and everybody agrees on. And for gravity, the iconal scattering limit uh, scales in D dimension something like, uh, I guess the, the factors are too important. Uh, but I'll just write it down. So just for be explicit. And you can see that paper for a discussion on that. But this is well, this is well understood. It, it uh, scales like this exponentially uh, at high s. And so if I looked at a fixed angle <coughs> scattering, at fixed angles, uh, then the modulus of t uh, scales like s, uh, in which case uh, I can uh, easily take s to be complex in such a way that this amplitude grows exponentially. So if you trust the iconal uh, approximation, you already have in the iconal limit a non-polynomially banded scattering amplitude, which is a signature of non-locality. But uh, the iconal is not really applicable at this time. It's not clearly applicable, no. But, uh, so, uh, but that's, let's say, the first, the first piece of evidence. Okay. So then there is a more conjectural uh, uh, argument that uh, when you go into the region of black hole production, um, that uh, the uh, in that region the for and we and we go we complexify we go uh, off shell so for momentum transfer greater than zero, then uh, it's uh, they argue that the scattering amplitude uh, scales like the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, associated with the energy square root of s uh, times, um, let me get it right, square root of t. Uh, and for t less than zero, this is an i, so it's polynomially bounded. If t is less than zero, it's polynomially bounded. <laughs> so t greater than zero is not polynomially bounded. And a truly local field theory would be polynomially bounded for all complex values uh, of t. Uh, so they, they argue that in the region of black hole production, you would violate uh, uh, polynomial boundedness, at least for some complex uh, And you? Yeah. If you do the iconal for elect quantum electrodynamics, uh, will you find the same problem, or in this case, no? Uh, I'm not sure of them, but you... Because sure. people have computed a lot of for QCD, there yeah. must be a lot of literature. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. After, okay. uh, 
So anyway, so Giddings uh, and uh, Giddings has numerous papers on this, uh, arguing that there is some degree of non-locality in, in any quantum theory of gravity. Uh, uh, and in particular, there's something called the giddings lippert locality band. And so why, is it, why, why should it be non-local at all? Uh, and the picture is that um, when I scatter two very high energy particles together, so when S starts running above the Planck scale, then there are, uh, when the cross section, sorry, when the impact parameter associated with that becomes less than the Schwarzschild radius associated with that energy, then you expect to produce a uh, black hole. So this is uh, one of those things that is not really well established, but everybody believes uh, to be true. And the production of a black hole, black hole, if, you know, being an extended object, uh, is inherently a sort of non-local thing. Uh, and in fact, as the, of course, as we, as we all know, the Schwarzschild radius uh, goes up as the energy goes up, uh, which is essentially a U V I R mixing. So the higher the energies, the larger the black hole you produce, and that's a UVI or mixing, again, which is something you would not expect to be able to get in a local field theory. So the picture is, and you can, you can read those uh, reviews and those papers for that story, that, um, that uh, essentially it is the fact, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the black hole production region, that, uh, the fact that you can produce black holes and that is expected to dominate the high energy physics of, of scattering and gravity, that that will create an inherent <coughs> locality uh, which is ultimately responsible for this failure of polynomial boundedness uh, in, this, in the at very least in the black hole production. Sorry, and so, so this boundedness has to, has to hold the um, foreignty, not just in the... Uh, yeah, the, if a local field theory is bounded everywhere in the complex plane. Just, just because of the, the it just follows from the tempedness assumption. So if you if you assume the full Mandelstam double spectra representation, uh, it would be polynomially bounded everywhere, and that's what Quasar uh, uh, derived the limit and so on. Well, I thought it should be exponentially suppressed because it's very unlikely for the black hole to decay just to two particles. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, it, it, well, that's on the physical axis. This is in the uh, this is uh, this is uh, unphysical. Mm -hmm. This is for t greater than zero. Uh, for t less than zero, it's exponentially suppressed. Which one is physical? T less than zero. T less than zero is physical. Don't ask me why. Okay. Yeah, t less than zero is the physical region, and so t greater than zero is is uh, is continued into the complex plane. Was on the real axis, but you get the idea. Uh, uh, and so it's unbounded on the on the unphysical region. So it doesn't violate unitarity. Of course, unitarity says it can't possibly grow exponentially on the physical region. But it preserves unitarity, but it violates polynomial boundaries. Yeah. Now, there's another argument, which uh, which is the one I'm um, uh, going to play on, is that uh, which which is by. So these these are sort of sketchy arguments. Okay, you may doubt them because they're not completely rigorous and so on, but these are arguments that suggest that in the gravity theory you should have some degree of non-locality. Uh, and that, of course, then modifies this whole reasoning. There's another argument by uh, Aharoni and Banks, uh, which is uh, which is the one that, that I use in particular, which is to say, take whatever quantum theory of gravity you want. Uh, they were thinking about M-theory, or whatever uh, theory you particularly want. But imagine you're looking at asymptotic uh, uh, fixed boundary conditions so that it's asym asym the sp asymptotic space has a time-like killing factor. It's just asymptotically, of course. So I mean, if, if, if you're looking at geometries which are asymptotic in Minkowski, that would be true. So you have time-like killing factor uh, at infinity. Uh, then, the time-like killing vector, you would expect quantum mechanics would tell you there should exist a generator associated with that, which is the Hamiltonian. And so, even though I may not be able to talk about local observables inside here, because in a gravitational theory there are no gauge invariant <coughs> observables, I may ex still expect there to be some, uh, some observables uh, for which, because of the asymptotic time-killing vector, I can uh, attach a time-dependence to. 
Uh, and so I can think about some Heisenberg type operator, uh, O of t, uh, just given by the normal kind of thing. <coughs> this is a Heisenberg type here. I think there's a good way around, there's a good way around this. So this is a Heisenberg operator, O of t. And so quantum mechanics would seem to suggest that as long as I have a time like killing vector, I know there's a symmetry that generates that. The generator is the Hamiltonian, and therefore I should be able to construct uh, time-dependent operators. Uh, sounds reasonable so far. But then the statement was, well, okay, uh, the, the, this fails actually in any quantum theory of gravity, because let's suppose I now look uh, at the two-point function. <laughs> Uh, then I know uh, I can do the normal spectra representation thing, so that I can always write that uh, through a color Neyman spectra representation as some superposition uh, over energy states uh, in which the energies of in, all the states are positive, that's a stability condition, or at least bounded below, so you can shift it to it's positive. But this thing is the analog of the, uh, the Schellen Neyman spectra representation. Uh, and so just to remind you what that is, um, you derive this by inserting a complete set of energy eigenspace, and then the definition uh, of the spectral density is the following. You sum over a complete set of energy eigenspace with the requirement that you only include those states that have energy E. And then you look at this inner product of the, uh, say the vacuum, if we're calculating vacuum two-point function, the operator at zero, and the intermediate energy uh, eigenstate. Okay, so that's just the definition of the spectral density you derive from there. Um, and uh, this thing obviously has to be positive uh, by unitarity. For scalar field theory, there's, uh, yeah, there's issues in gauge theories and so on. But in the scalar field theory, for example, this would be, if we got rid of the local gauge symmetry system, it would be possible. And their argument was that um, in, a, in a quantum theory of gravity, same as before, you expect the high energies uh, to be dominated uh, by the production of black holes. So in particular, within this sum, uh, this sum includes all, all states of the system, including bound states. And in some sense, a black hole is a kind of like a metastable uh, state, but uh, we can think of it as approximately bound for the sake of this argument. So what would happen is that basically you would have a sum. The argument is that if the energy is much bigger than the Planck scale, uh, that this spectral density will be dominated by the sum over the microstates of the black hole. <coughs> so there's a given microstate I, and I'll sum over, uh, sum over all those microstates. And that will, that will be the thing that will dominate uh, the high energy production. And by that, I mean a black hole of total energy E, of course. OK? So that was the assumption. Uh, and now the point is, if, if you assume that this operator has uh, a similar overlap with all the different states of a black hole, which is not unreasonable, we know, of course, that the number of microstates grows exponentially as uh, in four dimensions, as uh, by the Bekenstein uh, Hawking entropy formula, it's e to the uh, e times, um, uh, sorry, it's e to the, it's e to the entropy the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, which is the area, which is the mass squared, and so it's energy squared, so it's like E squared over M prime squared, uh, times a typical uh, matrix element between a given macro, black hole microstate uh, and the operator. <coughs> so that right now, E to the E squared. Uh, and in different dimensions, it's a different answer. Uh, so unless this thing happens itself to be exponentially suppressed, which they argue a typical operator wouldn't be, the problem is that then this spectral density grows like e to the s, which is e to the e squared, over n Planck squared. 
And then you go back in here and say, okay, now let me try and compute that in real time. So I'm doing this integral. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm integrating over e from 0 to infinity. And of course, this is infinite. It doesn't convert. Okay. So if, if the spectral density really grew exponentially faster than, basically faster than any linear exponential, then I can't go back to real space. And there, are, there is then no Heisenberg uh, <coughs> operator in real space formulation. There is an Elementor space, there's no problem calculating this quantity, but there's no real space uh, formulation. And that is then uh, tied to the fact that uh, there is some degree of non-locality. We can't pin these operators down as local quantities, <coughs> even of time, in a quantum theory of gravity, because at least time diffeomorphism invariance would, uh, would, forbid, would forbid you uh, from doing that. And in fact, you can, you can argue very simply that this, because of this growth, you can derive effectively that you only have locality, uh, you only have locality at space-time distances larger than the Schwarzschild radius associated with the energy running through the system. And so only if you average your operators over some distance of that order can you actually uh, get uh, an expression for this and you get the finite expression. So, uh, no, 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 no. Minus two. Yeah. I'm going to keep going. What about Hawking radiation? <laughs> no, I'm going to try and make it very short. Because Can I ask something? What about Hawking radiation? I mean, the, 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 you make the energy larger and larger and larger. That's right. So what happens is that you get these metastable states of that energy with that number of microstates, and eventually they, they decay into to, to free particles. That of energy. But that doesn't really change the argument. Just the number of degrees of freedom counting this addition. So the, uh, if, if the spectral density grows as the density of states, then we know in a quantum theory of gravity we expect the density of states to grow at least as fast as, fast as the e to the entropy. Uh, that's, that's the essence of the argument. So, uh, so what's this going to do with Galileans? Uh, so my, uh, uh, so my potential conjecture for the Galileans is that the Galileans should be viewed uh, as uh, uh, gravitational theories in this sense. And by that I mean, so where we know every gravitational theory in the, in the gravity theory, there are no local gauge invariant observables. That's a simple theorem. It's profound consequences, and we can view this as a manifestation of that. And so I'm going to say that in Galilean theory, there are also no local uh, gauge invariant observables in some fine sense that I don't have time uh, to get into. But more concretely, what I'm going to say is that uh, for Galilean, <coughs> I, its spectral density, so this scaling over here, this exponential, the e to the entropy, we can write it in another way. Uh, it's e to the e times uh, the Schwarzschild radius. Now, in massive gravity, or in Galilean type theories, there's another radius that's relevant, which is the Weinstein radius. Uh, and so we should think of, if we're talking about massive gravity, as well as having the Schwarzschild radius, we have the Weinstein radius. And the Weinstein radius, uh, uh, you normally think of it in terms of the mass of an external source. So the, the normal calculation goes that you have some mass of a source, it creates a profile around it, and then the Weinstein radius is something like the cube root of the, the mass with some of the parameters in. Uh, but uh, you can phrase that differently. You can compute the energy of the Galilean field configuration generated by that mass source. That has finite self-energy because the Galilean interactions regulate the normal uh, divergence of the free massive field, makes it finite self-energy. And so if I rewrite this answer back in terms of the energy of the Galilean field it creates, then the Weinstein radius four dimensions for any Galilean model or any or massive gravity uh, or bi gravity or whatever it goes like e over lambda to the one fifth where lambda is the strong coupling state. So that's the Weinstein radius and now <coughs> analog of the uh, uh, of the Schwarzschild radius. And so uh, to cut a long story short I'm going to conjecture that um, uh, the Galileans are gravitational in the sense that their spectral density scale like e to the e over lambda uh, to the six fifths. That's one of the lambda dimensions, right? 
which is basically e uh, e r star root. Uh, now, if that's true, this growth, because r increases with energy, this is growth is faster than a linear exponential, means that this integral doesn't converge, so I can't talk about the two-point function of Galileans in real space, space without smoothing out. So it implies some degree of non-locality, which for any given scattering experiment, would uh, you basically only recover locality for distances larger than the Einstein radius associated with the uh, uh, scattering energy. Uh, now that, that statement would be mute would I not, were I not be able to prove it for one particular Galilean model. Um, and so I can't, uh, I'll run out of time, so. Uh, so let me cut the story very quickly. So uh, there is, uh, <coughs> what we do is we make use of the Galilean duality symmetry, Galilean, sorry, the Galilean duality, which is a map between different Galilean theories, Galilean 1 goes to Galilean 2, uh, and it's a, it's a, uh, the map is a, a field-dependent uh, diffeomorphism, which looks like this. So if I, if I have a Galilean field pi, let me construct, we're given coordinate x, this new coordinate, and then associated with that, um, I can define the dual Galilean field row. And then the duality is a map <laughs> what it is the statement is that the action of the Galilean pi of x for one Galilean is equal to a different Galilean in terms uh, of rho of x. And in particular, there is a non-trivial Galilean theory, which in four dimensions would be a quintic Galilean, which is dual to a free quantum field theory. Okay, so. Uh, explicitly, that looks like there is a duality between uh, specific uh, quintic Galilean, whose action takes the following form, the determinant of 1 plus d d pi, uh, but that's just a Galilean. For those of you that are familiar with the Galilean Lagrangians, there are characteristic polynomials which come from expanding the determinant, so one of the Galileans is just the determinant itself of that combination times the ordinary kinetic term. And through the duality, this is equivalent to uh, a free theory. Through a, a, a non-trivial uh, uh, map. Uh, but the point is, I know how to quantize a free theory. So I can use that duality at the quantum level to infer a quantization uh, prescription for this particular uh, quintic Galilean model. And that's what we do. And to cut a long story short, we find that indeed, if we compute the spectral density, <coughs> now a function of, of k, uh, of, the, uh, of the Galilean field in vacuum between intermediate momenta, particle states. So we sum, sum over states Pm whose momenta uh, is equal to k. This thing indeed grows exponentially as e over lambda to the six bits, uh, which confirms the prediction that if you use the Galilean duality to provide a quantization, then indeed you get this behavior which implies this uh, locality bound. Uh, and more concretely, what you find is that within that spectral sum, the dominant contributions to the spectral density come from intermediate particle states with a finite number of particles for which the finite number of particles depends on energy as uh, e times r star of e, uh, which means that the typical energy per quanta e over n uh, of the intermediate uh, states that contribute to the spectral density is 1 over r star of e. Uh, and this is uh, completely consistent with the uh, classicalization story picture which some of you may have heard about, in particular the, the quantum end portrait of um, uh, and Domes, uh, who conjecture that in theories that classicalize, and I don't have enough time to say what that means, 
but that instead of uh, that, what happens is that when you scatter two very high energy particles, you preferentially produce n particle states uh, where n scales as e times r star v. Now, this is not a scattering matrix calculation. This is the Wyman function. But we see in this Wyman function that a dominant contribution in spectral density comes from finite particle number of states with that particular uh, behavior. And so that supports some view that some aspect of the classicalization story may be relevant in understanding uh, these uh, Galilean theories and then by extension, massive gravity and so on and so on. Sorry. 